So, GNU Radio. Software defined radios. Let's start with by taking a look at one. Here's the one I. There's one of the ones I'll be using. It's amazing how they've changed these in the last uh, like three months. Let me plug this one in again. It's like a thumb drive. Yeah, it's actually smaller than a lot of the thumb drives I have. All right, uh, disclaimer. Ah, GNU radio can transmit frequencies that are protected by the FCC. It can also do wonderful things with uh, bandwidth that's open and not really controlled, the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bandwidth and stuff like that, depending upon the software radio you have. Uh, for the most part, these are very low power devices, but please still be very mindful of that. Uh, GNU radio can also do certain activities such as replay attacks, which can get you in trouble with the DMCA and other organizations. Uh, in short, always be careful with it. I spend a lot more time sp playing around with the receiving side than the transmitting side because it's usually a lot safer to do that. But it is kind of cool to be able to replay certain things just to cause fun things to happen. Yes? If you have an amateur radio license, do certain frequent does it help with certain frequencies on transmission? Or is it just because it's commercial space protected and stuff still? Uh, well, you get all the bandwidth uh, depending upon what level you have. Okay. But it's for the most part, I haven't really spent a lot of time in those bands. The thing is, this thing is the power on these varies so much from receiver to receiver. It's, sure. It could be you could be pushing too much in the wrong area. So. Oh, okay. Because the power really. Okay. Because they're not as accurate. Well, it depends on what you get. If you get the uh, Edis Research ones, then you probably could actually do more with it. These are not near as. Some more hobbyist. These are actually uh, very ghetto, <laughs> the, way it's, the way they were created. What is GNU Radio? Uh, GNU Radio, or GNU Radio, or however you want to pronounce it, is a software-defined radio. What is a software-defined radio? Designed radio, actually. Uh, it's, it should be defined. A software-defined radio is a radio that uses general-purpose hardware and software to receive and transmit audio. In this case, radio. Uh, typically, this is done by using a USRP, which is a Universal Software Radio Peripheral. One more time. While you can receive AM transmissions with nothing more than a crystal diode and an antenna, receiving more complex transmissions such as FM requires custom chips. An SDR does as much of this as possible in the software. So it uses as little chips based on it as possible. If you look at the actual contents inside this EasyCap TV, you'll see there's pretty much a capacitor, the R2, RTL 2832 chip, and a couple other pieces, and it's next to nothing for what it can do. The biggest chip's probably USB interface. Yep. Uh, three last terms, we already did USRP. Uh, UHD is the USRP hardware driver. Drivers to allow you to access the USRP. Some people write their own custom software using the UHD software. These are the people who really get into the weird stuff on it. And another uh, definition is DVB-T, which is Didio vo Didio... Digital Video yes. Broadcast Terrestrial. Yes, Digital Video Broadcast Terrestrial, original purpose the RTL 2832 receivers. Uh, let's fire up a simple demo to show how an FM radio can work. Just going to use a new radio companion for it, which is the high level interface on top of it. And use the, let me make sure I get the right one. Like a, um, firmware that loads into the, the GNU Radio Companion? GNU Radio Companion is a very simple, uh, it's an interface that runs on top of GNU Radio. Oh, okay. So it lets you draw everything out graphically. The way we have it defined here, over to the left, we have the RTL 2832 source, which just defines the hardware interface for that. Uh, we've got a throttle, which keeps the sample rate down. We've got a low pass filter. This is a very basic radio. This is not going to sound near as good as the other ones we'll put in, as the, as the GQRZ one we'll take a look at later on, GQRX one later on. But it shows the basics of how it works. You can see the templates for this get more and more complex. If you go out and grab the GNU Radio Companion examples, they have radios that are like four or five pages of this that are laid on top of each other in more and more detail. <clears throat> so the majority of the stuff is laid out right here. The low pass filter, the receiver, the audio sync. We can build it either one of two ways. We can either generate it to a Python file, which we can run with just GNU, 
with just the straight Kadoo radio, or we can execute it through here. Let's just execute it through here. And this is going to sound kind of bad because this is a very simple one. Unknown error code. Okay. Or we cannot run it through here. Yeah. Why are you doing this to me? All right, this is the point where you fall back in the basics. Okay, you want to be difficult. Be difficult. We'll plug in. I'll use the easy DVT one. So why am I getting, <clears throat> let me fall back to, browser's not taken, is it? No. Let me fall back to this one, which is a, it will sound crappy, but it will work. Yeah, also's busy. What? Um, trying to figure out why I'm having the also. also control sound, but I'm using pulse audio on this. I don't know why it's. There might be a an adapter. Oh, I've never had it do this to me before. Well, if this did work, it would be really awesome. Well, I know it was running because you were running. I was using GQRZ. Oh. All right, that shows how an old temperamental it can be, which is an important part of all demos. So we flip back out the easy DVT, and we plug in this one again. But it gives you the core idea of what it looks like, which is it's pretty much laid out through a block diagram, and it, everything's laid out through there. One nice thing about it, you can actually have it generate that as a set of code, which it already has. Um. Yes. Is there still something like the PLL phase lock loop for the tuning? Or is that just sort of, you know, that's built into the software? It's built into it. You can do it uh, a couple different ways on this one. But this one, all the one, the way this is laid out, it's laid out, everything's hard coded. The frequency is laid out as a variable and stuff like that on top of it. But when you play around with the ETL locks, you can get the information back from it. Here's a generated set of the code. It's laid out in Python. It imports it all the bare components into it. And it uses a WX Windows, the WX GUI, not WX Windows. They changed it due to a threatened lawsuit from Microsoft. Because <laughs> Windows is a computer, is a term owned by Microsoft. But it lays out the basics for how it goes. So not too complicated for the most part. The GNU Radio Companion can get you the base for a very good beginning setup on it, which can be very nice. But one thing is, if we take a look at this, we can... Here's the actual file that flows into the GNU Radio Companion. It's just laid out as a basic XML file. So you're doing XML, which generates Python, which calls a whole bunch of C to actually run the program. So Aaron, yes. do you want a question to lay at the end of your pad? No, ask it now. So you can use the $20 hardware device, Yes. a new radio, and time shift NPR, for example. Yes, very easily. 
It can do all sorts of wonderful things with it. One thing to keep in mind is uh, <clears throat> one of the really great things about the uh, new radio companion and stuff like this when you're laying the stuff out, you can either dump the uh, stuff out, you can intercept it either as the raw input or you can save the output that comes out from the, that would go to the audio sync. So you can save it multiple places. Obviously you save the raw input to all the data, it's going to be a huge, huge file. But if you're grabbing something like information from the International Space Station, obviously you only have a certain period of time to grab that information. You want to grab that, save that, then do post-processing on it because more like the nice thing about getting written about uh, NPR is it's available pretty much all the time. So, well, no, I mean, very small windows where it's not. It's small frame very frame small frame windows. Frame. So a simple application would be twenty-dollar hardware device, new radio, it outputs the wave. You then turn the wave into an MP3. You probably downsample it. Yeah. Probably, Talk is what you can do, what, 32K or... Yeah, you, you can always use the old speaks code from uh, Bunty. But there's a lot of options in there. But the thing is, you can do anything you want to with it, which is where it gets interesting. And you can also take a look at all sorts of weird uh, frequencies and stuff like that. Uh, so the parts of the demo were the receiver, the software, the program. So the receiver, here's one of the example ones. This is called, a, this is an RTL 2832 dongle. Uh, typically, the old days an SDR cost you between two hundred fifty and two thousand dollars. The Edis ones were around the two thousand dollar point, and the Funcube dongles were up about five to six hundred dollars. Excuse me, Jay. Fun. Funcube. Funcube fun dong. Okay. Funcube dongles, that, that, which is actually about equivalent in terms of performance. Can't do as much as this can, but it's uh, it was a, it was pretty much the entry level approach towards it. And there was a whole lot of interesting stuff because the Edis guys had had their own, their own custom software, their own custom hardware built, and a lot of people said, "Why don't you release the specs for it so we can make our own and just be more open source about it?" It's like, no. <laughs> we like our two thousand. Well, it's, they spent a lot of time working on it, and it's not just GNU Radio that runs with the uh, Edis uh, research stuff either. A lot of other people use it for other things like that. There's supposed to be some sort of sell, selling to the military and stuff like that, but. Nothing will be confirmed or that kind of stuff. Sure, sure, works. Yes. But a guy, a guy who will go down in history, an idiot Palisari, discovered that some DVB-T receivers can be used as basic SDRs. So the digital video broadcast terrestrial uh, receiver is used over in Europe for actually receiving TV. This guy, and I don't know how he, fi he figured out the chips on it and figured out the, the frequency range it would support, and said, hey, I could use that with software-defined radio. And this guy... Should be working at NASA, or should be like in the Hall of Fame with the guy who came up with Whippets, because this guy <laughs> figured stuff out, man. <clears throat> and the professor from Gilligan's Island. How many people know what Whippets are? Oh, yeah. you know what it is. Don't you lie to me, Matt. Yes. The idea is you take a can of whipped cream, and this is an important part of all the like meetings that are drug Kids references. Do not do this at home. No, no, no. It's inhalants are bad because they will cause serious brain damage. You may end up in management. Uh, if you hit the nozzle a split second before the whipped cream comes out, some nitrous oxide comes out, you snort that, you get high for like four to five seconds. And apparently that's a lot of fun until you end up with your nozzle full of whipped cream. So that guy, who never got the credit he deserved, is gonna should be part of history. But fortunately, Antiety Pulosari, who his name I'm butchering, will have his place. So there are limits to these receivers that the other ones don't have. 8-bit receiving, a certain sampling limitations, certain holes in what it can and can't sample, but it's still pretty freaking amazing. You can buy these receivers for 20 bucks at most. In some cases, you can get them for less than that. If you buy from Deal Extreme, they've had some for like $11. What's the name of that website? Deal Extreme. It got it a little bit further on in this okay. thing, but it's, it's actually, you've hit Deal Extreme, have you? No. <sighs> Everyone should hit you Deal Extreme. you see them on Amazon? I've seen a few on Amazon, but they're a little more expensive. They're 32 bucks on Amazon. Deal Extreme. Yeah, ships from Hong Kong. There's a US Most people buy them for one of, uh, th the, 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 there's three places that are really popular to buy them from. Uh, uh, Deal Extreme, eBay, eBay has loads of them, and the third place a lot of people buy them from is something called AliExpress. Uh, has anybody here ever used AliExpress? I know the name, but I've not. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Did that work for you? Uh, I got a really crabby helicopter that wasn't even worth flying. The Simas are the way to go. Twenty bucks, man. They are the Simas S107s. Yeah, because I you got can. Those two, those are good. I, I tried a twelve dollar one. <laughs> twelve bucks shipped from China. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, because the Simon S one hundred sevens are nice because you can actually charge them off USB, which is stellar about the mini helis. But the uh, AliExpress, the idea behind that is very simply: you agree to do the purchase, they ship you the hardware, you then validate it, and then it releases the payment. Usually, is what my understanding of it is. Hmm. It's kind of so it's a little different, but they have all sorts of weird stuff on there. If you want to get things like. Uh, you want to get different, uh, all sorts of different things on there. They have like uh, Android set-top boxes, all sorts of weird stuff on AliExpress. It is just got stuff you've never seen before. But AliExpress. better than going like Pacific with all the closed out radios. Yes. <laughs> well, the one thing about it is the DVBTs aren't that popular in the U.S. because they won't receive U.S. TV broadcasts. So the only purpose to buy one in the U.S. is either you're going to Europe, or you oh. want a gift to piss someone off, or. <laughs> <laughs> Or you are going to use it for self defined radio. radio. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, here's a couple examples of the ones on here. Here's one of the ones. Actually, this is quite close to the one I have. There's uh, one thing to keep in mind. Some of the ones have the, the right chip in it. Some don't have the right chip in it. Uh, we'll show you later on. There's a list that actually exists which goes through all the compatible ones, which you want to make sure, obviously, you get the right one because an incompatible one is next to useless for you. So the simple FM receiver I was showing before was based on the 2H, 2H20 uh, in their Tumblr blogs. So what we actually, let me actually fire up GQRZ, actually show you an actual working demo, which would probably be very nice. You can also record it to a file, all this stuff on it. Squelch, all sorts of options are available to you. I just discovered this like uh, three days ago, and it is the way to go. Because if you what you want to do is you want to see what's happening on a frequency, something like that. Well, it gives you the oscilloscope yeah. like readings. Yes, it does. Which is one of the things that only before well, there's only the Windows programs provided. These is being used by a lot of people who are spending a lot of time on it now. Is actually quite cool. So actually, if you're looking for frequencies and stuff like that. It is definitely the one, the winner, and it's very, very easy to use. Online app. Once you go through the incredible pain and suffering, and I can't put enough emphasis on it, the pain and suffering of installing a new radio. Did I mention the pain and suffering? Is there an Android app for it? Is there a radio on Android? I haven't seen one yet. That would be interesting. So what is the pain and suffering? You plug the device in and you have to get it and you're done? No, 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 no. We'll get to that. Hey, uh, yes. Uh, on this one, it's set. It's set pretty narrow. You can go wider. It's, it's there's some limitations in the actual uh, software the way it's compiled up. But the guy says you can override a lot of them if you want to start going to town on it. Because the thing about the GQRZ is it GQRX, excuse me, is it runs on top of GNU Radio, so it's got all the power of that. One thing it doesn't do, which I would really like, is if this would dump out its all its specs into. Uh, your new radio companions, so you can actually just modify the radios it generates, but it doesn't do that yet. But it does have a pretty active development base right now, so that gives you a basic idea. And that's FM. You yes. can get AM? Oh, yeah. Really? Let's, uh, I mean, where did I? I didn't close it out. Yep. So you got to put the right uh, factors in here. You actually have. Uh, Continuous wave, oh, raw IQ, all sorts of stuff. Does it also transmit? No, this is receiving only. The way this is set up right now, this, this program is. Can you reverse it? You have a source. I don't know. Having something that would randomly broadcast that you could just drag and drop to transmit stuff would be kind of a little dicey. If you want to do transmissions, largely you'll do it with GNU Radio itself. 
not through the GQRZ program, the GQRX. Okay. But, but GNU Radio itself can do it. And actually, there's a, we'll take a look at one of the guys who has put together some of the documentation on it. He has a, he uses a, the DVB-T dongles with a, a simple uh, webcams to just broadcast webcam stuff to a centralized location and start aggregating information. So really, pretty much you can do almost anything you want to with it. It's a software-defined radio. You can have it do anything that you can come up with that actually involves everything. One of the things people were using for a while ago was actually uh, doing replay attacks. If you, uh, actually DealerStream probably sells this. It's this crappy little um, uh, RF thing that actually works with your phone and it plugs in like a USB mouse stick. And it actually, will, whenever you walk a certain distance away, will lock your PC automatically for you. What people figured out was that is you get the right frequency, you can just redo the replay on it and just have it set up to just periodically send that thing. So you don't need to know anything about the actual piece of code being used by it. You just have to replay that component. And when you start looking around in the frequencies, you can see all sorts of interesting stuff, especially stuff that if you can actually figure out what it's doing in terms of just right. basic logic, you can actually start doing a little bit of fuzzing with it, which offers tremendous capabilities to it. Because all of a sudden it's like, let's start changing some information inside it. You're obviously, you're not going to get it back necessarily as zeros and ones in that situation. But some of the stuff you actually can through GNU Radio is because some of it comes back actually being digital. Well, the nice thing about it, if you're getting a digital transmission, and there's actual digital information there, usually you either get it perfectly or you get nothing. So then you start the process of fuzzing with it, which is all open to play with. It's the great thing about GNU Radio. I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why it's one of the coolest things in the, around. If you start thinking about all this stuff in terms of un just in terms of what you can do in terms of replay attacks, small alterations to stuff, there's lots of stuff to be done with it. Yes, it's one of the wonderful things about it. One thing to keep in mind is the uh, GNU Radio uh, RTL 2832 drivers are recent into the GNU Radio stack, so they haven't necessarily been stable in all ways yet. The Edis guys and those have a, a lot more better setup. So, that was a quick demo of GNU Radio. What else can you do with it? Basic radios, AM, FM, shortwave, RFID hacking. Uh, that's getting a little more interesting. Because it does RFID really well in terms of replay and stuff like that. You start playing. Uh, yeah. People are using it for that. Uh, GSM snooping. Really? Uh, not so much with these because of the bandwidth limitations, but sure. some of the better ones you can. Uh, satellite reception, people are picking up that. Both, uh, actually, there's a guy who actually gets stuff from Inmarsat, which is geosynchronous, 23,000 miles up. And you can also, there's people who've done stuff with these receivers, actually, and getting stuff from, like, the International Space Station. they start getting your old prime dishes out. Actually, the one guy, will, will actually, I've got, I'll show his video here in a minute, but it actually, he does use, has a nice little antenna for it. People figure out the math for it, because, I mean, obviously, it's ba basic radio math, so you create the antenna at the right sure. stuff. And the uh, Amateur Radio Relay League has a whole bunch of information about software-defined radios that makes them that available. Uh, P25 decryption analysis. Everybody know what P20, anybody know what P25 is? It's used for, um, by P, uh, firefighters... Ambulances, stuff like that, emergency workers. It's, it's one of the standards mm -hmm. things being used for that component. And it's been have done a pretty decent job with that. Uh, and of course, hacking the wireless PC locks is one of the other ones that's pretty popular. Uh, let's take a look at the RFID listening modification. It's a presentation. Ah, thank you. It in both, that's nice. How many of you have heard about the subway hack and that? Yeah, I mean, subway hack guys. These guys spent some time figuring out the. Um, I don't know, do pen tests of the subway stuff, which is just amazing stuff. But the one we're interested in. Is this the one they tried to have blocked? Oh, yes, they did. Okay. It's 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 very uh, interesting that they uh, there was a there was a thread of a lawsuit which was just astonishing uh, between the groups and stuff like that because these guys really just ripped them apart. It's a great uh, there's a link inside the, the presentation to it. It's definitely worthwhile to just read their whole thing. The attack on the physical security was just uh, breezed by the. This is very illegal. Yes, the part we're covering is going to. Let, let, let me let me. I already put that at the front. 
so the following education materials for educational purposes only. But the one I thought was best when they started buying it. But, oop. Come on, where's that? All right, so the RFID. Oh. Yep. So they figured out they want to know about the RFID, so they had to figure out how to do it. And they had to, of course, figure out what sort of hardware you're going to use for it. And there's, of course, several choices. Uh, you can just, actually, the simple way to do it is get the RFID reader writer, 50 bucks. Uh, the open PCD, open PIC one, uh, PICC one, it works pretty well. And they went with the USRP one, which, of course, and they want the seven hundred dollars. Yes, and they wrote their own plugin for it. And here's an example of what a real a nice the uh, SDR can do. This is a, gives you an idea of what you get for your. This is what you get for your seven hundred dollars, or what you get for your thirty dollars. Definitely something to be said for that. So they figured it out, just uh, tuned it, started reading off the information. Oh, 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 and you start figuring out the information. And they just went to town on it. And the great thing about it is, once they figured it out, they owned it. So this is an example of one of the things you can kind of do. Because what you're getting here now, especially when you think about it, this is actually at least was protected. A lot of the stuff people are doing over this, they're not protecting at all because they're assuming just because it's on the frequencies, that is safe. So there's a whole load of stuff. But this whole talk is, well, i got to show you one other thing in here, which was awesome. The brute force it approach <laughs> was a crowbar. I love that. But they were playing around with it. I'm going to show one other thing. War ballooning. War carding. War carding. They're car <laughs> <laughs> this is the card they put together to figure out the uh, underground system. A PA speakers? Yes. Uh, it's, they went to town on it. Pronouncing and intimidating music. But these guys use. These guys attacked it in every way possible, the Boston subway system. But the uh, GNU radio part played only once part of it, but they figured out any one of these was a, a wonderful hack for them. Probably the best hack for them actually was the social engineering. But the GNU radio stuff could do a lot of stuff. Information for them got them stuff, and they could start doing the fuzzing and stuff like that with it. So it's just a great paper. If you, uh, they never, I don't think they actually did the presentation because there was so much legal threat on them. But the presentation is out there on the net. So definitely... Uh, Make sure to grab it if you're interested in it. That said smoke grenade launcher? That has all sorts of stuff. It's they, <laughs> Well, the worst thing was when they went off to eBay and they started buying all like the hats and stuff like that. And people were like, of course, once you have the right hat and the right badges, how many people are going to ask questions? Once you start oh, thinking of something I like that. I mean, if I showed up in the AIM Institute and just did they might go, hey, who's the new guy? <laughs> but you start thinking of the Boston subway system, you're talking thousands of people. New people aren't going to raise any suspicion. Before, but not necessarily yeah. <clears throat> Especially, you also figure there's so many different uh, so many different levels of employees and stuff like that. It's like they don't tend to mix it with stuff, so it's just a wonderful system. P25, P25, listening. P25 is a digital radio communication standard used by most safety agencies, federal, local, state for communication. Let's take a look at uh, this thing. This is done by a guy named Balint 256. I'm sure. Hopefully, it's got a better pronunciation than that. I think it's Balint Balint 256. Because ball int doesn't sound near as impressive. But he also has uh, put together a couple pages on YouTube. He's got a new tutorial section up, which is very nice. If you want to find the uh, any information about the RTL 2832 on um, YouTube, look for the world, world's cheapest whatever, and more than likely that'll be what it's about. <laughs> Hello again, I'm back with an update on ultra cheap SDR with the Realtek based digital TV USB receiver. I like to demonstrate it being used to receive a digital mode, oh. but before that I'd like to thank the community for taking the time to check out and provide feedback on the code that enables its use in GNU Radio and on Windows. So I'd like to demonstrate it being used to receive P25. These are two P25 compliant radios, the XTS5000 
in the XTS 3000. P25 is a digital voice specification that's used by first responders worldwide. It's also known as APCO Project 25. There on the floor I've got the Realtek USB dongle. And if you have a look Same over one. here, this is the web page for OP25, now hosted on Osmocom. It is an open source implementation sound, sound card. In the top left hand corner, it's free to send it through. That's a lot of software definitions yeah. in there. Wow. Yeah, that's how he has his laid out. It's a little more to it than any of the basic ones we have. This actually does decryption stuff as well. So you have to do a module for that? No, it's all written through here. Huh. But he actually, I think he actually calls a Python module with it. One th way, thing about the way GNU Radio is set up is you have the high level stuff is written in Python. Then you go into the deeper level stuff. All the performance related stuff is written in C++ for performance reasons. And you start looking at some of that code and it is just amazingly tight code. They know what the hell they're doing. Because the GNU Radio project's also been around about 11 years, so mm. give or take. Do the so I give you an idea of what are the more in the top left corner we have the RTL 2832. Many of the parameters speak to whichever. And hopefully we will see four narrow lines. I'm just going to key up now. Ah! Is that part of the. Uh... Yes. It's the part of the GNU Radio we put together. You can find all this stuff in there. So we had the four narrow lines, but the audio sounded garbled. And this is actually because I'm transmitting with an encrypted digital stream. If you look there on the top of the radio, the little notch here is on the encrypted symbol. And this radio itself has a DES OFB crypto board, and it has a key loaded in there, a test key that we use for testing purposes. If we scroll down and look at the OP25 decoder block, there is actually a key property that you can set, and I actually put in the wrong key on purpose, but we can actually correct that and hopefully get some audio coming out. Before I do that though, I've got the other radio on here. You'll notice that when I key up, no audio will come out of this one because it doesn't have a crypto board, and so only the light will blink at the top meaning that there's a transmission, but because it doesn't have the keys nor the crypto board, uh, it can't actually decode the audio. So let's have a so look. It's coming right after Keying it, up so. on there, and you can see it blinking on the other radio. So now let me run this flow graph. I've corrected the key. And let's see how we go. Switching into the divots view. All right. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. One, two, three. One, two, three. He, I think he does. He's just so uh, that appeared to work quite nicely. Okay. Yeah. If you want to learn more about P25 or the OP25 yep. project, please check out the website. You can also view a video of a talk given by Matt Robert. But that gives you a core idea of what it can do. And so it can actually do decryption, pull all the sort of stuff down. It can do all sorts of cool things when you start writing the blocks for it. So it has quite a bit of capability there. <coughs> so is it just dump it to a file and then read the parse the file? This guy was doing it live. You can do it to a file, then process the file, or you can do it in as part of the transmission, as part of as so you're receiving. So the file portion, you'd be like doing your testing, trying to figure out what it is. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're not going to you keep sending it, it over and over you can again. Build it in. Yeah. Yeah, somebody just walked out. So, but in terms of what you can do in terms of capabilities, pretty much you can dump it to a file. You can uh, process initially. When they first did the RTL 2832, and the guy first wrote the uh, uh, code for it, you actually had to dump it to a file, then process the file post that. But now they've actually gotten the code figured out and actually have gotten it incorporated into the GNU Radio companion, GNU Radio project. So it's actually part of it now. So you've got a choice of what you want to do with it. You can file or do it the other way. Satellite reception. Let me show you this one real quick. So this is a mega Os mega from Mega Oscar videos. He's another guy who does it. He uses a simple dish, receiver information from the MR satellite network. They're big Europe. Well, they've satellite. had the. Oops. It's in that same. Yeah. World's cheapest. Uh, you see, there. It seems, it seems like that was the common denominator. To all these ones when I was saving them. There's 
Hi folks, this is probably one of the world's cheapest Inmarsat reception systems. This is a very small uh, 45 centimeters diameter dish. Um, it's using a lock periodic antenna. I think there's a squirrel, I don't know what the... Uh, at the feet. This one is specified from 900 megahertz to 2.6 gigahertz. Continuous uh, coverage. So it's a very tiny antenna. And what I have here, you can hardly see it. I have to use yeah. a few adapters because I didn't have other ones. But there is a very tiny here, uh, USB DVB-T stick. And that's the actual receiver here. That's wow, it. Got all the tiny it's uh, streaming an IQ stream. That would be the hammer the nano. PC through the USB cable, which is here. It's such a long USB cable. Well, that's what he has. <laughs> and what we have here is a in Mars. This is a, I believe, WinHSR, a Windows program. It's a little bit of frequency. The nominal frequency is 1541.425. For the network control channel on Inmarsat Atlantic Ocean region on 15 degrees west, a geostationary satellite. Signal to noise ratio is um, close to 20 dB. No preamp, as you have seen before, just the DBBT USB stick. And we are seeing here a total bandwidth of 1 megahertz. It's, uh, this uh, tuner is using or this USB stick is using the same tuner chip as the famous FunCube dongle. The only difference is that you have a wide band signal here. And if we would uh, zoom into this one, if we apply the zoom there, we will get a similar signal as on a FunCube dongle. Uh, how much do we have right now? Yeah, we have roughly 100 kilohertz uh, bandwidth now, which is roughly what you would see on a FunCube dongle as well. So it's only a little snapshot of the overall bandwidth. So for um, for very low cost, you can build an Inmarsat uh, reception system. The sound that you hear here out of the speaker, you could uh, feed into a decoding software and decode the Inmarsat C uh, digital signal. This is a 1200 volt BPSK signal. And um, there are some decoders available on the internet. <laughs> I hope you no, enjoyed they're, they're this low cost system. And uh, if you own one of these DVB-T sticks, maybe you will try it uh, someday on your own. Thank you for watching. So that gives you an idea of what they can do with it there. There's, yeah. What did, you, what did you say was 1200 by? The uh, data stream from the Inmarsat. So one thing to keep in mind is when you buy one of these, if you depending upon which one you get, you'll either get a mini jack or a regular size jack. You want the regular size jack so you can get the uh, European TV adapter at uh, Radio Shack for like six bucks, which lets you plug it into a regular coax cable. Yeah, this regular app thing you can just plug into any antenna. That's why I just had lying around the house. So. It does improve the quality of the reception. So you can pick up stuff from outer space. You can uh, listen to P25 stuff. You get the keys right if they don't encrypt the information. You can do RFID stuff. You can do replay attacks or a whole bunch of stuff. You can use it as a, as a well, it's 20 bucks. It's actually not a, the world's cheapest FM radio, but it's still <laughs> not bad. So that's quite a few capabilities to it there. What's a replay attack? Hmm? You grab a, snap, a sample of code, like the authentication or something that's happening, and then you just play it back again. Data. If you, Hopefully Yeah, you just play the data back again. It's like if you get an unlock, just send the unlock again later on if someone locks it. Like a, a example, door. a garage door opener would be a perfect example. Okay. A lot of that but stuff tends to go with a little more advanced. Those are all rolling <laughs> codes, though. Some are, some are. It depends on how old the one you're well, talking about. Think it, of an access card for, like, a door. Yeah. Because that's RFID, so very, very simple. But you... It gets back to the point you have to get your antenna in, you have to get in the transmission somewhere along the lines and stuff like that. So one of the things you can keep in mind is if you were doing this in a horrible situation, you would probably just put some sort of uh, receiver up because the RFID stuff will broadcast all the time. And then you just have to have somebody walk by it and ha you can actually have your antenna located in the right location and then you can try and grab some of that information. 
and try and play that and see what it does. But you can do that regular RFID stuff as well. There's toolkits that make that that would make that available for educational purposes. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff to modify stuff. When you start looking at the RFID, uh, the RFID stuff, you can start going nuts. This is actually is kind of interesting because you're actually not just hacking the card, you're hacking the actual transmission, which is where things get interesting. But it can do a lot of weird stuff. Uh, so GNU Radio it goes back to 2001. It's licensed under GPL V3. It supports a variety of radios, NS Research, Funcube dongles, and now the RTL 2832. There's also some other ones out there as well, but these are the most popular ones. And right now the RTL 2832 is just, I mean, it's by and far the most popular one because, once again, it's $12. How to install a GNU radio? There are several ways to get that, to, to install the GNU radio stack. Uh, many of them are incredibly painful with a combination of magic, voodoo, and animal sacrifice. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll be very, very, very happy when it's over. Or, and this is what something I discovered when I started playing around with it, is you can use the Bill Canoe Radio Script from Shirley Ra Shirley's Bay Radio Astronomy Consortium. The hint is use the Benu Bill Canoe Radio Script. Uh, there's also a Windows version as well. If you have Ubuntu, there is actually a version of Canoe Radio in there. It is really, 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 really old. And it has no, it has no idea what an RTL 2832 is. Well, the problem with it is, GNU Radio is changing so quickly in some areas that it's just, uh, it, no one, yeah, there's no maintainer that's keeping it active, and it's very hard to do that kind of stuff. And there's a whole, people are concerned about the possible legality of starting to get into this. If you're, if you're in a place like uh, Russia or something like that that has different rules, bus software for hacking stuff, you're theoretically opening yourself up to questions. Yeah. So why the uh, because you can now do it for 20 bucks. I was interested in GNU Radio. I mean, remember Matt and I talked about it five or six years ago. We were sitting there going, man, I'd love to do GNU Radio, but what if it, What if I don't like it? What if it sucks? What if it's horrible? What if I spent $2,000 on this? So that's pretty much where it stopped. Yes? What version is GNU uh, Radio currently in? I don't even have the number. I just grabbed the latest uh, uh, from the CVS uh, about three weeks ago. I build from the good uh, the Bill GNU radio script will grab the latest CVS release. Okay, I know it's in the Fedora. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how recent one is in Fedora. It's probably I don't know if it's going to have the. Uh, well, let's find out. That's the wonders of having the internet. It is magic. It's all magic. You know that. Three point six. Then okay, you beat me to it. Which is sensitive. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. But the, there's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do with the uh, Bill GNU Radio script. Let me actually show you the script, what it does. Da, 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 da. So first off, it's a shell script that's 1,241 lines long. It ha it's actually really, if you want to see a really well-written bash script, it is really well-written. And well-common. Yes. One thing to keep in mind is if you're running this on Linux Mint, it will think it's a Mint system, not, an, a, not a Debian system, and it will just and do a whole bunch of stuff to you. Let me take a look at uh, UDEV. Yes, here's the available functions for it. So it'll grab the prerequisites. It'll do a fetch from Git. Uh, it'll build the uh, the hardware device driver. It'll fetch the firmware if necessary. Uh, you can build a new radio. It'll modify your groups. It'll modify your UDEV because it actually has to put that in there as well, so it recognizes it when it goes. Uh, modify your syscontrol for larger net buffers, okay. and it does all this magically. Keep in mind if you have like oh let's say. 150 meg free on your system, and it's a pretty basic system. You're not going to be able to build GNU Radio because it will pull all sorts of crap that you never ever thought about needing. So what it does, it takes on my base system because I built the system just recently, rebuilt it, and it took uh, about 500 uh, megabytes plus when I was building the system, and it's still afterwards still held on to a big chunk of it. So it's not a, a lightweight system to build. But it's much better. I don't know how long it took because I let it go for three hours and I went to bed. And when I woke up like four hours later, it was actually done. So somewhere between three and seven hours. <laughs> I'm betting closer to the seven on this thing. Wow. 
But it's actually, but it, it, it changed, that's, that is the other thing that changes GNU Radio now, because it used to be figuring some of this stuff out was a case of going through the forums, going through, yes? So like P25, is that coming with it, or is that something else you have to find plug in? Uh, GNU Radio is just the base. Yeah. It gives you the GNU Radio Companion. You actually have to get diagrams and stuff like that. On, those, are actually, those are available through the GNU Radio Companion examples. Which uh, exists out there. There's all sorts of example radios out there. You'll have to modify a lot of them because a lot of them are configured for the Edison and, and the uh, FunCube dongles. So you have to make some modifications to them. But for the most part, it's not too bad. What you normally end up doing, you, one of the nice things about the GNU Radio Companion is you can just cut and paste from one to the other one. So you just pretty much just change the software def definition at the front. I haven't found a way in, uh, to how do they, they abstract it out yet because it would really be nice if you could just have one thing saying, this is my radio type, and just be able to load all the other GNU Radio Companion files on it. But in terms of what it can do, the GNU Radio Companion examples gives a whole lot of stuff on there. And the GNU Radio documentation is starting to catch up with it. So, so yeah, I haven't played around the Windows version all yet. There's also supposed to be a version of Mac OS X, but it's not supported right now, so I imagine that's probably falling quite a bit behind. Um, so, the way the, the example we took a look at the beginning, the one that didn't work, which is how well, I'll, I'll always remember it, is uh, there was a file called RTL GRC, which is the high level XML description of the program. And the RTML uh, GRC is converted to a file called top level.py for Python, PY actually, for Python. And then that's actually run by GNU Radio. And the core components of GNU Radio are written in C for all the performance reasons that you so desperately need. I imagine you could write a version of GNU Radio totally in Python if you had access to a supercomputer. But given the fact you're doing so much stuff in terms of the FFTs and stuff like that, FS for your transforms, you really need it, parts to be written inside C++. Yes? So at a fundamental level, this is something that's taking the radio signal and converting it into something that's more like an audio signal. The computer do all the processing by itself? Yes. It does. It, you give it the. It, it theoretically pulls all the information back, okay. but you're only listening to certain parts of it at any given time. There's you have to give it like restrictions because it just can't. Theoretically, depending upon how it's powerful. Be too much bandwidth. Yeah, the Edis could pull down if you're trying to pull. The Edis can pull. It has like four decoders at one time, so you can grab like four big streams. Oh, nice. But the thing about that is, well, you're also back to two thousand oh, dollars. And if you have enough disk space and enough CPU, you can actually have it pretty much do semi-intelligent scanning of the stuff. And that's one of the things that some people have done with that. So you can actually get more information for it. For the most part, what this does is it's listening at a frequency, grabs it, converts it back to data. And what you do with the data, of course, is either you turn it back into radio frequency, you turn it to audio, you actually can use it for in terms of data. So you can actually do figuring out experimentation with that way. So what, how, do you, how does it get to just the frequency that you want? I mean, you said at the beginning. Okay. The way we said that we, you pass as a parameter to the firmware on the chip, the RTL 2832. The way we do it in the... Doo -doo -doo -doo. The way you do it here is when you do the, uh, the variable setting for frequency, which you... This is what the RTL 2832 expects for input. Uh, sample rates, which I, is what I've got set wrong right now, which is why it's, it's barfing on me. One of the reasons why it's barfing on me. Uh, the frequency, the hertz, the bandwidth, so you can set it to a certain size. Obviously, the chip in this can only handle so much, so if you know what you want and just set it to a smaller thing, you'll obviously get better quality on it. You can do a higher sampling rate. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with it. You've got to do a balance between the two. So is the chip that selects that frequency and then dumps it to the computer? You pass it. You do, you, when you initialize the chip, you actually pass that information. Okay. You pass this the GNU Radio Companion program. The, the GNU Radio thing actually passes it to, to through the USB chip, the uh, USB protocol. Right. On an electronic level, how does it how does it actually get that frequency? Is it actually just like a digital tuner then? Yeah. Okay. So it's got a bit. I mean, it's basically a, a just simple radio. If we take a look at it. It'll tell you what. Uh, actually, I don't have RTL test installed on in this. It'll tell you what bandwidth what it can figure out in terms of frequencies.
GNU Radio and Virtual Machines. Everybody, of course, loves Virtual Machines now. It's everything. It's the solution to all your problems. That and the cloud, between the two of them, it will solve every problem That's you could ever have. It supports the cloud. It's a virtual cloud. Yes. Yes. Yes, I've been a victim of the virtual cloud. So uh, there have been a couple of projects to create a virtual machine with GNU Radio. Uh, the USB performance of the VM is kind of limited, so this hasn't worked out too well yet. Obviously, if you're doing the radio stuff, you want to get it as pure as you can, to get as much bandwidth, as much data as you can get across for it. Um, one thing to keep in mind is also if you try and run a live USB stick, you might have some issues because you be competing with USB bandwidth depending on how qual the quality of your machine. Um, there is a project out there right now, because there's always a project out there, uh, putting together a demo CD with some pre-camp feeds and the Nopix remaster as a demo project. The idea there is to have a whole bunch of stuff in, and have GNU Radio ready to go so you can start playing with some sample ones and then either install it or else just be able to st stick a USB in there and see if you're actually sufficient to handle well, it. Probably good for education, like oh, yeah. doing a class. Yeah, well, the thing is if, if you combine it together with some of the other information, it's actually can be pretty useful now because it's, it's amazing how far the documentation has just come in like the last three or four months. It's just, I mean, just in terms of projects. Um, some tips for improving your GNU radio experience. Electrical noise is the killer to GNU radio. GNU radio on my iMac at home is much clearer than it is on my laptop. Especially right now because I've got all the cables laying on top of each other when you start thinking about, it's not a big deal when you're getting NPR, NPR, but when you're starting to get actual, when you're trying to pick up stuff from outer space, it tends to get a little more dicey. Because you can get lost in the electrical noise quite a bit. Don't put it in your power transformer. And yes. Like that. Uh, there's also one thing about this, my Dell M5030, is it is the world's cheapest laptop I think they've ever sold at Best Buy <laughs> with four gigs of RAM, which is exactly how I want. It's like, uh, do you want the extended warranty on it? Oh, no, I'll throw it away for breaks. <laughs> so uh, that's come out to be a thing about it. So uh, one of the things to consider is... Uh, the USB power for your card for an adapter so machine even consider batteries for cleaning power. So one thing a lot of people do when they're actually doing this, they'll actually unplug from the main. And some people actually have splitters that will actually power the USB, the, the actual tuner chip from batteries instead of actually powering it from the USB to try and simplify things. Do you need some of that? Yeah, I'm pulling you out. You, you gave me a look there. All right. So they're using a USB Y splitter? Yeah. So that they're putting the two power leads off to the side and the, the data's from Yeah. There. But that, I think you're getting to the point where these, some of these people are like, it makes it so much better. It's like, does it really, does it really make it better? But being unplugged from the adapter definitely can make a difference. Obviously, uh, that kind of stuff makes, unplugging the mouse. I would that, assume along those lines, you're not going to be running through a hub. You're going to want the direct connection. You can if you can make it fit. One of the great things about these adapters are, depending on which one you get, well, I mean, there's yeah. going to be so much of the noise. Oh, the no, the hub would be bad. Yeah. Is, is there a way to switch to optical? Not with these. Like, like is there, I don't know, is there a device that takes the USB signal and changes to optical? And Not that I'm aware of. I mean, if you get to the point with the Edis boards and stuff like that, they have other options like that. I wouldn't be surprised if you could actually probably get one with FireWire. If you would. I mean, I'm sure they probably, probably did one a couple years ago for that, just for their bandwidth. Well, I mean, there's, there's things like... Uh, So I had less yeah. uh, noise chance for signal. And yeah, like uh, yeah. Getting it to digital on the USB is definitely that's a good good point. One uh, suggestion a lot of people make is getting rid of the default antenna because the default antenna is made for well, first off, it's it, it, well, it's made for d doing DVB-T, so it's designed for TV signals and who knows how well it works. But if you get what the ones with the mic, the Mac, the uh, larger jack, you can actually just very simply go out and get it the European TV adapter like Radio Shack for like seven bucks, plug it in, then you can plug anything coax into it. This is just a straight up uh, digital TV antenna for HD TV. It works pretty well. Another one they said works really well is called the budget TV antenna, which they sell at Radio Shack too for like eleven bucks. So good old revenue. Yeah, there's also some how to's and word chokes can be put in the system to try and simplify things, but I haven't dug too deep into that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, a faster computer will improve your experience, especially if you're doing receiving and conversion at the same time. If you receive it to a file, then process it, you can do it with a netbook pretty easily. But you start getting to the point where you start dealing a lot more stuff, it's going to be, you'll start dropping information, you'll start getting static, you'll start having you stuff. You watch the load when you've done it on the smaller machine? Or? 
I haven't done it on too many small machines. I've done it on this, my iMac, and I've had it installed. I installed the WinHSR on my uh, netbook for a while there, but I just didn't really seem to work quite well. And I could, the problem with the, the netbook I have is the 800 by 600 resolution. It doesn't give you oh, a lot of... Limits the... Yeah. Limits well, how much stuff you can say. Yes? So you, I'm getting the impression that these are just standard TV tuners you can pick up. And yes. They're normally not used for this? No. These are used for something called a uh, digital video broadcast standard over in Europe. Okay. You get a DVD-T Android phone chip. Oh. <laughs> that's right. Because a lot of those... Oh, that's, oh. that's interesting. But yeah, the, the guy who came up with this just figured this out. that you, I had the same chip as the FunCube dongle and just went to town on it. So these are actually, that's the reason why there's been so much of an uptick in these, because originally the cost for the uh, board was between 700 to 2,000 bucks for a some software-defined radio. Nice TV company decided to cut custom contract the chip out. And they found, it was, it was one that was being used for uh, other stuff, but they figured it out. And the guy, and totally, and, and Nitty Puzzle, sorry, whatever his, his name is in the, early in the presentation, figured out you could actually use this for this, and that guy should be knighted. It's a, a it's a it's a it's a transmitter it's a as well. DSP essentially. Yes. Digital signal processor that you're telling it what to do. So you can buy this as a TV and they don't even advertise it as being able to send TV signals. Well, the cost on eBay they've gone up a lot. I don't think it's a transmitter. Think, yes. I think you have to have that US RD. I think they I think people will be able to use it for transmitting. I'm not I'm not sure on that to be honest. I haven't done any transmitting with it. Yeah. It would require hundred twenty dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely it's a possibility. Let me let's find out real quick. Yeah, transmitting does take a little bit more. Time. Yeah, it takes different uh, chips on it. Yeah, but the whole look of the radio interface would be so radically different on that small screen. Simple well, DVB no, transmitter. Yeah, plug it into it or something. You just no, let it do its thing. Once you need to um, use it. Here we go. GNU radio based ETSI DVB transmitter works. Yeah, I know you can do it with that software. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm not sure which one you, so if you do it. I don't know if you can do it with the RTL 2832. Actually, let's find that out. I have not played around with the, 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 the transmitting at all yet. Did you say transmit or transmission? Transmit. Transmit. Google understands. Use TX. Yeah. So, yeah. TX. What? TX. Yeah. TXRX, you know, transmitter. Wow. That might be specific. But USRP is ultra dog only does receive but can do full RX TX, so. Yeah. If there is any way to do it, they will figure it out. But it, it comes down, down to the fact is this is pretty much the cheapest, easiest way you're going to get into GNU Radio to play around with it, see if it actually is something interesting to you. Well, I guess suppose that uh, they're cheap enough you can buy two. Yeah. One receive, one transmit. Well, if they get to the point where they can get transmitting work on it. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I don't understand why that, that should be that big of a deal. You have to take the signal if you want to amplify it and send it back the other way. It's like the reverse. Well, well, there's yeah, there's so limitations in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. 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 But you piece them together, actually try and you can actually have them piece stuff together. I mean, GNU Radio is pretty much unlimited what it can do. But, but the the core being, this is pretty much all I've been playing around with. Is I haven't tried to do anything with the transmit side on it. There are transmit examples out there. I mean, I just can give a spin, but I don't know if it's support. I doubt it actually is. But uh, so improving your uh, stream. If you do have a slow machine, grabbing a stream to a file, which will be huge because it's a lot of data. Unless you actually cut back on the sampling side stuff, and then you can process it. You can also do this for some of the simple replays. I actually want to make a really simple one to go for it. If you do have the right chip to send, uh, desktops tend to be quieter than laptops. Just do the additional space in the middle cases. That makes a lot of pretty much standard stuff. Uh, a bit more about the RTL 2832 dongles. 
there's three major places to buy them Deal Extreme, eBay, and AliExpress. I bought a dongle from uh, both uh, D D D uh, Deal Extreme and eBay. One thing to keep in mind if you buy from Deal Extreme, it comes from China. If you buy from eBay, more likely they're going to be shipping it from China. So don't be planning on doing it this weekend if you order it tonight. It takes a while for it to get here, but I've received, I had pretty good luck with it. Another thing to keep in mind is be very careful when you're actually ordering because some of the chips don't have the RTL2832. They have some other chips inside there and they have to figure that out. Uh, da -da -da. The RTL, uh, RTL SDR compatibility guide, which is at Reddit. Let's actually open that up real quick. No, do not do this to me. Gives you a basic lay down of the uh, systems. The easy cap ones are pretty popular. There's the nano. Yeah, the ham, there's the ham and nano is a pretty popular one because it's like really tiny. That's the one the guy with the MR sat, I believe, was using. But there's a whole load of which ones can and can't work. The My Chaco TV, I still like that name. <laughs> and the Uniku. So it gives you an idea of uh, the Peak, the Nooski. Which, which isn't Russian, which is, you would imagine new scheme would be. But it gives you a core one of chips to buy. Make sure to obviously get the right one because that will make things go a lot better for you. As in terms of it will work. As I mentioned before, AliExpress is kind of a weird situation the way they're laid out in terms of their stuff. You can buy stuff from them and apparently, I've never bought anything from them, but apparently they ship you the item, then you validate it and release the payment. But let me actually show you AliExpress real quick. That is just, it's kind of like fries online. Kind of like Amazon then? Oh, it's, no, you can buy stuff Say here. I do, and they gorgeous down. Uh, here's one of the ones for 10 something odd. Looks, no, I don't Three think it's Yes, but actually if you look at the stuff they have on here, here let me show you an example of what we're talking about. Android set top. Android TV boxes. So you can actually have for 79 bucks get an uh, 40 yes HDMI set top box for Android. Has all sorts of weird stuff on it, which just now you want one gig for the RAM. So, oh, there's the um, stop right. Go down a little bit. Did you see the right there? The new arrival, cheapest mini. That's a USB dongle sized. Yes. Wi-Fi, Flash, 3D, 2D game, and free shipping, 67. What? Yep. Wow. What? That, that's pretty cool. So I saw that on uh, The Verge and, and Gadget. So, Android 4 and it's a dongle? Yep. <laughs> What's the name of the site? AliExpress. A-L-I. What's yes. what, the M205 Wait, or something? Wait, DDR3? <laughs> it's all sorts. It's, I, I it's all the shit that. you ever wanted, man. I don't know. It's <laughs> probably yeah. crap. That's the point. Well, that, who, they've tested a chip that looks similar to this. Keep in mind, if you want to get a real, you can get i i pokes, i this, i that. You can get all sorts of stuff on here. So, of course, the saying goes well. The only reason why I didn't buy anything from AliExpress is because it's it is barbareware, but it is got some very cool stuff, and it's stuff that I need. <laughs> I, I need so badly. So. It's not safe to buy from this website. Uh, it's a different way of buying from it because you're actually buying. You're not buying from the website themselves. You promise they're a broker. You get it, and then somebody it, you it, pay for it once you get it. Yes. And you can use PayPal. No, you. Uh, they actually are the broker for the info, for the transaction stuff like that. It, it's kind of like you're buying something from eBay, except you don't pay for it until after you receive it. But it's you don't have the some of the guarantees you do with eBay. I don't. I don't know. I, I, there's a reason why. But it's got stuff I want. It's got. You, I need yeah. this. This this right here, the Android two point, eh, not the two point two, but the uh, oh, ten eighty p full HD Android, hundred some odd dollars. What would I think? Of what you could do with all this stuff? There's all sorts of stuff you need in here. But it goes back to the, the core concept. I mean, it, it's a little different way of doing it. Obviously, be careful with it. But it, it seems like it's got stuff stuff I need. Uh, I'm gonna break down and buy stuff from them. 
but you're actually inf individual. So, so the compatibility guide will make your life much, much better. That's just one of the most important things to keep in mind. Uh, is it worth it? Uh, I was on the play around with Canoe Radio going back years. The initial price, thousand bucks, was way too high for me. For twenty bucks, it's been a lot of fun. I'm still just getting started really with Canoe Radio itself, just trying to figure out what it can do in terms of for me and, and that kind of stuff. I, yeah, it's been it's been been well, quite for a bit twenty fun. bucks. You can. It's really easy to learn radio theory and tennis yes. design. Yes. Yeah. Sorts of stuff. Actually, there's a couple of people at the uh, the MIT Open Courseware. Uh, if you look into that, there's some stuff about the radio theory and stuff like that that people are recommending actually helps them figure out how to use mm -hmm. GNU Radio. Because keep in mind, GNU Radio isn't just being done by people or just hobbies and stuff. There's people that do this stu kind of stuff for their living. I mean, the guy from Edison, the guys from Edison have been in business for, well, probably 11 years, 11 plus years now because they've been doing the GNU Radio stuff and they survive by doing this and selling various software defined radios. So they've got a pretty good run at it. So the easier path that we were talking about is that the, the program that we showed you a little bit ago, GQRX, which is actually the one we just fired up. Let me just uh, go back to her again. Not, So that's just GQRX, which is just a really simple interface to it. It runs on top of the GNU radio stuff, and it uh, just makes your life much, much easier. If you just want to play around listening to bandwidth and stuff like that, it is works very, very well for you. Hmm? Oh, what, 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 do you, what do you want? You want to talk radio again? <laughs> No, uh, no, but it can do well. It, but it makes it very interesting just to play around, just to see what it can do. And it also has some of the modes and decoders and stuff in it as well. So, not hmm? uh, continue to request the for benedictions and to venerate. Just uh, playing around mostly with the uh, basic stuff. Nothing too exotic on it yet. I've been trying to get figure out some of the frequencies for some some of the. Uh, Stuff runs on and around my house and stuff, and I haven't had much luck with that yet. I thought it was more of the oscilloscope, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah, I mean, even with the oscilloscope, you could have separate and then center frequency, just like a spectrum analyzer. Speaking of, uh, do you know what the sampling frequency is for the visual display? Uh, for this one, I think it's set to one. Uh, what do we have it set to right now? It's not defined in here, but it's usually 1.5. Okay. That's what it is. Oh, you hear you get fast, slower. Yeah, that's Let's see if I got the other option. Range, size, receiver options. Yeah. That's where we're at. So it gives you quite a bit of things to play around with. But the core being, obviously, if you want to build something more advanced, obviously, you can change almost anything you want to inside the uh, GNU Radio Companion side. Okay. Let me fire that back up again, real quick. It depends on which one you get. Some of the chips will do a lot more frequencies than others. Let me see if I actually can get this one to tell me. I think he had two earlier. Yeah. Yes, there's a gap in the middle of it. No, it's just a, a gap inside the actual chip. Did they do? See which one we got on this one. Beyond. Come on, give me what I want. It's busy. Yes. Ah, L band. 
It can pull multiple frequencies back. It's got the gap inside it, but it can pick a pretty wide range on it. I don't remember exactly what it is, but you can actually, let's find out. The wonders of. Yes, there's a program, in, in one of the ones that comes with it called RTL test, which will tell you what old frequencies will support. Let's see if I can which one on here. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. So you could essentially get 164. You can get the weather radio. You can get all sorts of stuff with it. So we needs to make a software based on like controller or timer for a bunch of them, you know, based array, based off some really nice ass uh, ATP. <laughs> ah, here we go. Frequency, the Elonix uh, E4000, widest possible range, 64 to 700 megahertz with a gap uh, from 1100 to 12, from 1100 to 1250 MH megahertz when used out of spec. But that varies from the, the, the Depending upon which tuner you get, the easy caps can do certain things. It it's actually it's kind of interesting the way it's laid out right now. This is all from the Reddit uh, uh, higher level page on that. Why, why is there that gap? Why is that gap there from? 1100? Why is there a hole in a donut? Because <laughs> it's there. No, I don't know why. I think it's something Maybe to do with. That's no possibility. I mean, it's a hardware limitation though. So. Okay. But I mean, some of the chips. I mean, if you get a chip from some other group, that maybe that they'll support it. Who knows? But okay, just this chip then. Yeah, okay. it's just this RTL twenty eight thirty two. But you can use the RTL test programs to give that information on it. And if you want to go lower level, you can actually just actually capture stuff at the command line without using GNU radio and stuff like that as well. If you know the frequency, the range, all that stuff, you can set all the information and it's captured to a file and do processing later on. You could then bring it into GNU radio and do stuff with it and stuff. So. It's pretty much there. I really aren't a whole lot of limitations to it. Yeah. So it gives, can do quite a bit for you. So actually, there's a actually a guy is just putting one together, but he's not much further along than uh, unfortunately than than I am right now. Which is I built GNU Radio, I installed this, I got rid of my default antenna. My life is pretty good now. And then I discovered GQRX and. I don't spend all my life swearing at the at the dongle anymore. So, but for the most part, the GNU radio stuff, the documentation that some of it's great, some of it's lame. The wiki is pretty much where you go, but that the quality of that can vary tremendously as well. But I, there's so many people playing with it now that I think you're gonna see a, an uptick inside the qual inside the, the amount of documentation because there are so many people. It's like if it's like when the Linksys router was known to be hackable, things. Like yeah. That. Well, I think if you look at the way it worked out, I mean, if you looked at the pretty much the uh, if you look six months ago, the average person using GNU Radio probably had been using it for five plus years. N uh, probably 90% were five plus years on it. Now, if you look at it, probably 90% of them are less than the last six months because it's just so much people have taken up just because they can play with it now and do weird things with it. Um, I have one of these things. I've been messing with the last week or two. Cool. Um, I've been, okay, I, I can use Linux a little, um, uh -huh. but I can't just leave like this. And, yeah. Uh, so I've been messing with the Windows side. Are you using WinHSR or WinRed? Uh, HD SDR. Uh. Um, and then one called WinRed. Okay. And I have a lot of There's one, there's also one called SDR Sharp. I haven't tried yet. Uh. But, um, anyway, GNU Radio looks like it has a lot more capabilities. GNU Radio is a lot more capabilities. I mean, you can run GNU Radio under Linux itself because it does use the WX GUI, which you it will run under. Win. No, 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 it's WX GUI. It will run under. I have not, I don't, it's not. Um, you don't have to build it there. There's actually pre-compiled packages out there for it. So definitely give that a spin. And theoretically, the GQRX stuff should be able to run on there because that uses the QT toolkit. And it runs on top of the higher level, so it might be possible to run that as well. I haven't tried I haven't tried that out yet. But if it does, that would definitely be a much uh, better way to go. Because in terms of capabilities, it can do a lot of stuff. It makes GNU Radio makes the uh, impossible possible. And it makes the possible very difficult sometimes, <laughs> but uh, but it can do a lot of stuff for you. But definitely, it's worthwhile to play around with a bit more. Definitely try the GNU Radio uh, Companion stuff. 
you know, there are some examples for it and stuff like that, and it just can do. Uh, and if you get GQRX, if somebody's got a pre precompiled for Windows, that I mean, obviously, just in terms of scanning and stuff like that, would be. I think that's the next step for me. I, I did the script. It's installed. I pulled it up. It works. That's as far as I got. It. Yeah. Yeah, the overlay is good. Yeah, they do a pretty good job with that stuff. So yeah, definitely if you can, uh, if you want it, want the easier path, this is definitely the way to go. Uh, there's a couple other projects, the HDSR, which is a, uh, which is a Windows program that runs. Uh, it's closed source, but so it is freeware. It's designed with the interface it's supposed to work well in netbooks. I haven't played around because I don't do Windows unless I really have to. I have no choice. Uh, another one's WinRAD, Windows only. It's open source. Another question: Not use their name, same as the Perl license, pretty much. Uh, freeware it hasn't been updated in two years. They're looking for a new coder. So if you know somebody who's good with Borland's Code Gear and Barcardero, how do you pronounce that? Barcardero. Corinthian leather. <laughs> but. Uh, that's pretty much the whole thing of where C++ Builder went through. Right. They're looking for someone to get in touch. But if you do the WinRAD, you have to do the file based. You have to dump it to a file with the command line stuff and then actually import the file into it. But they're uh, looking for developers, somebody's interested in helping them out. Uh, so we've got four pages of links to go through just talk about a high level. So GNU Radio site, www.gnuradio.org. I know it seems pretty exotic compared to most of them. but uh, slides online somewhere? I... We'll provide them to. Me, yeah. I, I provide you the link to a couple weeks ago. Huh? I provide you, provided you a link to. I'll send them to you again. But a hack a day. How many people read hack a day? Not every day. <laughs> oh. Most days. Hack a day is quite honestly one of the greatest things around. So you can do it's quite as simple as let's take a look for RTL 2832 working software defined radio TV tuner card da, 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 da. this is where I first he started hearing about this one existing and apparently somebody playing around with passive radar with these which yeah that's interesting it's a lot of yeah so uh, actually, one thing that's really been that's uh, it's about two slides ahead. Da, 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 is the power base is the, a gentleman out there has been together a getting or or lady I believe it's a dude, uh, Tom Nardi probably a dude. Uh, is putting together his uh, stuff, getting started with RTL SDR, which he goes through the basics of uh, the high level information about it. Talks about the antenna upgrade. And all that stuff. I, this is something I discovered about the GQRX thing, which is just really nice. <laughs> I do like this the way he's got defined a quote unquote simple software and uh, software radio and GNU radio. But he has a whole bunch of, he has some information he's putting together on, which is actually pretty good stuff. But before we get too far away from uh, Hackaday, I got to show you one other thing since we're here. So Hackaday also has a section on what would you imagine? Your, what's near? What's the what's the one thing you're lording over me that you have that I don't have right now besides your job? Raspberry Pi. Yes. There's a whole section of Raspberry Pi hacks. So. Watch controlling the Pi. Yes. Getting a console and Quake 2 running on the Pi. Do you have Quake running on yours yet? No. Nope. Well, obviously you're slacking. <laughs> but. So Hackaday has all sorts of stuff on there. You look for the radio section, they have all sorts of information about it. It's just a pretty good, cool site for that information. You must have used the laser cutter on that case. What's the uh, minimum requirements to run this? The dongle? Uh, no, dongle? For, for the computer? For the computer? Uh, if you're running like on or something? Uh, if you're running, I mean, a decent Linux thing, I mean, if you got a... a, a Computer in the last couple of years, obviously, it'll work pretty well on it. I haven't run any performance problems on the ones I've played around with so far. If you're talking about running on a netbook with a low, low end, so low, low end Atom, really well, you could probably still use it, but you'd probably have to break it into steps. You'd probably have to capture the data, then process the data afterwards, instead of trying to process it in line. Just listening for signals. Like, like, turn this switch on when this happens. I 
don't know, you could probably go pretty low on it, depending on how. If you, the thing is, keep in mind, if you can restrict back the, free, the bandwidth, uh, all that information, you can just have it do less stuff. So it might work for you. So RTSL compatibility guide was the one we showed you a little bit ago on Reddit. Uh, it, the Amateur Radio Relay League, uh, Amateur Radio Relay League, has a, a, a section of their site that's defined to SDR. It's a little bit older material, but it has a lot of the good concepts and stuff on there. And if you are interested in playing around this stuff, obviously uh, the ham radio guys are a great group of guys. There's a couple groups around town. Obviously, I don't know if they're, they do their, still do all, all of them do their meetings, all that stuff all the time. And they, I don't know if they've done one on software defined radio yet, but they have just a good group of guys. And, and definitely they have a lot of information about stuff like that will help keep you out of jail when you, if you do start trying to play around with the transmit side and stuff like that. Uh, getting started with the RTL website, that was the one we talked showed just a second ago for that right for Deal Extreme Power Base. Uh, the fun stuff, Yablog, is a guy putting together some stuff on Tumblr. He's got a pretty simple stuff right now, but he's got some potential with his stuff. Uh, GQRX, just want to make sure I include it in here because it's definitely the way to go. It'll make your life suck much, much less. OZ9AEC's website. It's the guy who, uh, home of the, the uh, GQRX stuff and some other interesting stuff, uh, such as the DV... I don't know, actually, I'm not sure if he has a DVB transmitter or not. Let's take a look at that real quick. But he's done some interesting stuff with his uh, system. But he, he's the guy who's doing a lot of, putting together a lot of information on the stuff, so. But he's got some very cool stuff, what he's working on. He's putting together some documentation as well, which definitely works out. Be interesting. It's a great site, definitely worthwhile to take a look at. Uh, the GNU Radio uh, tutorial page, the uh, Balint. Hopefully it's correct. Uh, it's much better than Balint, <laughs> which I know it's going to be. Just say Balint. Balint, yes. Balint has got some stuff he's putting together on just how to the basic stuff of works of uh, GNU Radio, and it's really a nice uh, place to get started. He has right now, I believe last I looked, he had like five or six tutorials, but they talk about some basic theory and that kind of stuff, how to do setup, that kind of information. Very good stuff. Definitely worthwhile to take a look at. And that's about all I got. So. Where I'm at with it, I've been playing with it. I've figured a couple things out. There's still stuff I'm trying to figure out, but I'm hoping the documentation stuff of that will get better in the next uh, period of time. But if you do want to get started with it, there's no better time. It's not going to get, I can't see them getting cheaper. But in terms of that, all you really need is some disk space, Linux, Windows, whatever you want to run it on, and just go to town on it. Anybody got any questions? Uh, yeah. Where's, where's your presentation going to be? Uh, it'll be on, on the, the OLUG site. It'll be on OLUG.org. How many uh, slash presentations? I've got uh, the two or three. I've got one I think I may have misplaced slash given to someone or not. I'm not sure if I did. I don't know. It's just the part of the wonder of it. So far, I've been pretty much playing around just the basics, just seeing what it can and can't do in terms of receiving. So. RF remote controls for TVs. Yeah. <laughs> but what it can do in terms of in terms of what it can do in terms of uh, capabilities of transmitting, I. Really don't. I actually, the more I think about it, the more I know. It's, I'm pretty sure it's pretty well limited in that space. But in terms of receiving, you can do almost anything you want to with it within those bandwidths. So, um, give it a spin. If it works out and you like it, definitely it's worthwhile to consider. Because the, the one nice thing about this is, it's probably going to bring down the cost of the other devices as well. Hopefully, we'll get to the point where we can get yourself an Edis for 500 bucks or whatever, which would make things a lot better. And then you can start doing some real stuff with it. But it's a great way to get started on it, and it's a, been interesting for me. Great. That's all I got. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Yes. Now I need to drink. <laughs>